For many in the UK, brownies recall troops of girls clad in brown and yellow, earning badges in a prelude to joining the Girl Guides. Yet the name actually references the helpful fairies that apparently did housework overnight to help their chosen households. Catherine Briggs considers the brownies as one of the most easily described and most recognisable fairy types, and their territory stretched from the Midlands up through the north and east of England and up into Scotland. They were known as the Booker in Wales, Bodak in the Highlands and Fenadori on the Isle of Man. But what are brownies? How do they relate to their fairy cousins? And what links are there between brownies and ghost stories? Let's find out in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. We are rattling along with our different types of fairy month and we're going to have a look at a much more typical type of fairy this week. We are going to have a look at the brownie, although it's quite interesting where this research actually took me because, again, it went down the route of are brownies just simply fairies or are they also something else? And again, it does sort of demonstrate the slipperiness of some of these categories. So let's start off with the big question, what are brownies? Well, we can essentially consider brownies as a type of fairy. As I said in the introduction, that is indeed what Catherine Briggs considers them to be. Although she also adds that many brownies seem connected to pools and streams. People often feared them, aside from those who had a brownie working for them. And they also hated Christian symbols. So in some ways, they do actually bear some similarities to both house and land spirits in that they seem incredibly localised, yet clearly more ancient than the humans for whom they worked. Briggs described the brownies found in the borders as being small men of around three feet in height, and I quote, dressed in brown clothes with brown faces and shaggy heads, end quote. They would do any work during the night that the servants hadn't done, so that might include reaping, threshing, herding sheep and even running errands. And brownies could become attached to a family member, as we'll see in a story later on in the episode, but a bowl of cream or a good cake became their right in return. So one belief saw housewives making, and I quote, knuckled cakes made from meal warm from the mill, end quote, and these were then toasted over the fire's embers and covered with honey. And then the housewife would leave them somewhere that the brownie would find them, but not overtly give them to the brownie herself. So she'd never hand them over because then that would be considered payment. And any form of payment would drive the brownie away. And we'll explore why that might be in a moment. But interestingly, Emma Richardson actually links the brownie with the Northumberland Silky, who we met a few weeks ago. And part of that is obviously through this semblance of them tidying if you'd left somewhere really untidy. But the key point of his description of the useful brownie is when he calls it that old familiar law. Now, perhaps I'm reading too much into this, which, let's be honest, is possible. But a law, spelled L-A-R, was a tutelary deity in the old Roman religion. And at one point, each household had its own law and they offered a prayer to them every morning. They made extra offerings at family festivals. So does Richardson mean to syncretise the brownie with the ancient idea of the house spirit? And if so, it could offer another explanation as to why payment was so anathema to the brownie. So why couldn't you reward a brownie for their services? Well, the stories do vary as to why you couldn't give any kind of payment. And the belief in Berwickshire was that the brownies were appointed to help ease the weight of Adam's curse. And part of this appointment was that they worked without payment. So it was kind of essentially part of the job conditions, as it were, that they weren't paid for their labour. And to be honest with you, that's just kind of, yeah, that doesn't sit well with me. But elsewhere, people thought that they were independent spirits, and indeed they were too free-spirited to accept wages or even human clothes, because both of these implied a form of bondage, and giving them these things would see them leave, as that might appear as if you're offering a form of work-based contract to them. Another theory was that a brownie could only accept payment once considered worthy of it, and the bonds of servitude only last until that point. And alternatively, the quality of the payment might also offend the brownie as well. And this might explain a tale from Lincolnshire that a farmer actually left a linen shirt for the farm's brownie every year, so the brownie didn't leave, it quite happily accepted this payment every year. 
But eventually the farm passed to another farmer, only this farmer was a bit of a miser, and he left a shirt made of coarse sackcloth, and the brownie left, obviously annoyed by this, and rightly so in my opinion, never to return. And Reginald Scott actually quoted a traditional brownie song in the 16th century, which suggests other brownies may have left their homes for the same reason. And the song ran, and I quote, what we have here, hempen, hampen, here will I never more tread nor stampen, end quote. So it is that idea of obviously if you're going to give someone payment for their services, at least make sure it's kind of equal to what they've done for you. Now, aside from offering payment and driving your brownie away, you could also offend them. And an offended brownie would either leave or become a bogart. And as an example, a brownie lived in Cranshaw's Berwickshire and he saved and thrashed corn every year until one year people just simply took him for granted. And someone thoughtlessly commented that no one had mowed or piled up the corn this time. The brownie heard the remark and threw the whole harvest over Raven Crag in response. Now, boggarts, on the other hand, were considered mischievous brownies, although their behaviour sounds way closer to that of a poltergeist. So you would often hear tales of them throwing things around the house or leaving the house in disarray if it was all nice and tidy. And one boggart tormented the house of a Yorkshire farmer named George Gilbertson, and he would snatch away the bread and butter from the farmer's children, and on some cases, he even shoved them into cupboards as well. Now, eventually, the pranks escalated in severity, and Mrs Gilbertson began to fear for her children's safety. So they tried to move house, but the boggart actually hid in a butter churn and went with them. So the family just simply returned home because they were like, well, if we're going to be tormented somewhere, we might as well be tormented in our own home. And they just essentially continued living with this torment until the boggart got bored and left of his own accord. By comparison, where people respected and well-treated their brownies, the brownie proved entirely committed to their master or mistress. Now, they could end up unpopular with the servants because they might expose any bad behaviour or punish them themselves. So in some stories, brownies actually fetched the midwife when the mistress went into labour, and this is a far cry from the tales in which fairies somehow hold up the journey either to or from the midwife. And Catherine Briggs actually relates the tale of the brownie who worked for Maxwell, Laird of Dalswinton. Now, the brownie was actually great friends with the Laird's daughter, so much so that the brownie even helped her plan her wedding. But yet, the groom actually moved into the bride's home so she could still be near the brownie. Later, when the bride went into labour, somebody needed to go and fetch the midwife. The problem was, the river ran too high and the straightest course actually led through the old pool. Now, the stable boy hesitated about going in this direction, having heard the tales of the brownie who lived in the pool. And yes, it was indeed our brownie, and I don't know if he necessarily made the connection or not. But the brownie then decided if the stable boy wasn't going to sort it out, he would. So he mounted the best horse and just simply rode straight across the water. He fetched the midwife and brought her back. Now, she wasn't happy about going by the pool, fearful that they might meet its resident brownie. But the brownie was like, you know what, you're fine, don't worry about it. And he carried her to the house all the same. Once she was at her work, the brownie went off to thrash the stable boy for not going to get the midwife himself. Now, unfortunately, the minister persuaded Maxwell that he should baptise the brownie as payment for his invaluable help. And rather than actually asking the brownie if he would like that first, the minister hid in the stable with his holy water. And he poured it onto the brownie, but he didn't even get a chance to begin the baptism because the moment the holy water touched the brownie, he yelled and vanished, never to return. Now, we do see many of the brownie traits in the tale of the Colorado Hilton. And this is a story that I mean, I've grown up with since I was really young because it's set at Hilton Castle near Sunderland. And according to the legend, the servants rarely saw this brownie, but they would hear him at night. So again, if they tidied the kitchen, he would create a great mess and hurl everything around the room. And if they left it messy, he would tidy it for them. Now, despite the somewhat obvious solution there, the servants did eventually get tired of his antics and they knew the only way to get rid of a brownie was to present them with new clothes. So they laid out a green hooded cloak beside the kitchen fire. Now, green was, of course, an excellent choice, being the colour favoured by the fairies and indeed one reason why you should never wear green at your wedding. The servants then hid around the kitchen so that they could see what would happen and at midnight the cold lad came into the kitchen. He spotted the cloak and put it on and by all accounts he was so pleased with it he danced around the kitchen wearing it until dawn at which point he cried out here's a cloak and there's a hood the cold lad of Hilton will do no more good and then he vanished never to be seen again. Now in some ways his antics recall those of the brownie especially through the act of tidying and the disappearance upon the receipt of clothing. Yet the throwing of items into disarray sounds more like a bogart, and indeed his somewhat contrary behaviour is rather reminiscent of the silky. 
Still, those in the neighbourhood were actually convinced that the coal lad was not a brownie, but a ghost. And this is where we start to see some of the slippages between these terms. Now, in the neighbourhood version of the story, a baron in a bygone era had a servant boy, and he'd ordered his horse to be ready, but when the specified time arrived, his horse did not. Tired of waiting, the baron went to the stables, and he actually found the servant boy asleep and was so incensed that he snatched up a pitchfork and struck him with it. The baron killed the boy, and suddenly cognizant of his actions, covered the body with straw. And that night, he threw the body into a pond. Now, according to the legend, someone discovered a boy's skeleton in the pond years later, although in this version, no details are given as to why they were looking in the first place. And with this version of the story, the coal lad apparently sang a verse in the dead of night. People take this as evidence of his spectral nature rather than his existence as a brownie. And he say, where's me, where's me? The acorn's not yet fallen from the tree that's to grow the wood, that's to make the cradle, that's to rock the bairn, that's to grow a man, that's to lay me. Obviously, where's me is like the northern way of saying woe is me, in case anyone was wondering. But laying here I refers to the act of laying a ghost or essentially getting rid of it. Though why he would be saying woe is me, that the man who could lay him hadn't been born yet, is a little bit more puzzling. That said, according to M.A. Richardson, Robert Hilton of Hilton Castle accidentally killed a man named Roger Skelton with a scythe. The coroner's inquest on 3rd of July 1609 recorded the details, so Richardson presumed that this story may have given the coal lad a legend its origin. And obviously I realise I'm reading out coal lad knowing how it's spelt, because obviously I'm looking at the blog post that this is attached to. If you're only listening to this and not reading it, cold is actually spelt C-A-U-L-D, and lad is lad. Now, Richardson also noted that there was a room in Hilton Castle known as the Coal Lads Room, and the owners would only ever use it if they needed an extra bedchamber, preferring to leave it empty otherwise. And even within the late 18th and early 19th century, and I quote, many persons worthy of credence, end quote, had heard the Coal Lads' unearthly wailings. Now, over time, this may have then been conflated with the legend of the Brownie. And that said, Richardson also refers to the genuine brownie as being an unembodied spirit. And I'm assuming that's supposed to being a disembodied spirit. And obviously ghosts would count as disembodied spirits. But as a result, he's then differentiating between the brownie and the coal lad. Now, it is possible that the epithet coal lad does indeed refer to a spectre, because a woman named Mrs Murray from the Borders told William Henderson about a coal lad in Cumberland, and she'd heard the tale as a child, and for this unfortunate ghost, the coal lad died of cold after mistreatment by his family. He continued to haunt the family, visibly shivering at the bedside of anyone who was about to be ill, and apparently you could even hear his teeth chattering. If the illness was going to be fatal, he'd put his cold hand on whichever body part would be afflicted and say, cold, cold, I cold, and ye's be cold for evermore. As in, yes, this is cold and you're going to be cold forever because you'll be dead. That said, we've already seen a fairy function as a death omen around the bar guest. You've got other fairies performing this particular role like the ben Nee and the ben She. So it's not too far-fetched to see the coal lad take on this function, especially if he is a form of brownie and thus related to the household to which he's attached. And this is definitely something to explore further. But ultimately, what do we make of the brownie? Well, much of the brownie law does attest that the brownie is in fact a type of fairy. They help around the house and as long as you treat them well, they'll be faithful and loyal to your household offend or insult them on the other hand and they'll leave or turn on you. Now it is really difficult to see any connections between brownies in a traditional sense and ghosts. In fact I rather think there are none and I do quite like that differentiation of Richardson's between an unembodied spirit which basically implies a spirit that's never had a body and a disembodied spirit which is essentially the spirit severed from its body. And I think that that is a good way to see the difference between the two. But the problem occurs with the coal lad tales because obviously in the, the Hilton Castle version, the coal lad is behaving like both a bogart and a brownie. But then when it's considered a ghost, it's hard to tell if brownie tales have simply been conflated with the type of spirit that appears in the histories of many old families. But it does demonstrate the somewhat fluid boundaries between the tales, and it also shows what happens when stories are repeated over time, becoming confused or embroidered the more often that they're told. And this is something that we need to bear in mind with folklore, that it's difficult to take the stories as reported at face value. We don't know how well known or how oft told these tales are. So instead of them necessarily telling us much about the stories themselves, they're actually giving us a bit of a snapshot of the people who both reported and recorded the stories. Though, like, I'm not being funny, but I certainly wouldn't risk leaving out clothes for anyone who did housework for me overnight. 
So that is our investigation of the brownie. I would love to know what you think. Do you think that the coal ladder Hilton is actually a brownie? Do you think he's a boggart? Or do you think that he may have actually been a ghost after all? And indeed, have you heard any tales from your local area of creatures like brownies and so on? If you have and you'd like to let me know, you can always leave a comment either on the YouTube video that this is for or also the blog post that this is attached to. And remember, if you're looking for any of my references or anything like that, you will always find them in the blog post that is linked in the show notes because I think it's important to show where stuff comes from, but it also means that you can then go and do some further research as well. So there we go. So we are going to be having a look at something else fairy related for the end of the month, but I haven't quite decided what that's going to be yet. I'm also going to Verona tomorrow as this is going out, so I'm going to be away for a few days. So I am going to be taking some pictures, I hope, of things related to Verona folklore and legends and so on. So if you want to see any of them, you can obviously follow me on Instagram and I'll post them there. But yeah, I hope to see you next week with whichever fair related post we end up doing. So I've got a couple of things in mind, but I haven't decided for definite. But we will be finishing off the month with more things fairy related. So yeah, I hope to see you next week and cheerio. Well, thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts because that helps other people find the show too. It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record and edit these episodes. So if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee. Or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below and thanks in advance. <laughs>